Hi, today we're going to talk about the selection sort. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at how it is implemented, the steps that it takes as we go through that algorithm, and we're going to look specifically at the big O behavior and how to determine that big O behavior of this particular algorithm and algorithms generally. So let's begin. Got an example here. We have seven numbers, numbers one through seven, in a, in a random order. And the way that the selection sort works, and the reason it's called the selection sort, is that we select from this list the maximum value. You can also do this with the minimum value, but for the purposes of this example, we're going to go through using the maximum value. Um, but we iterate through this list looking for the largest value. Now, for us as humans, that's easy to see. It's number seven. Um, but the way that the computer is going to do it is it's going to march through sequentially the list comparing, and that's the important part here, comparing each item um, to what it thinks is the current max. And uh, for our purposes, we're just going to assume at the beginning of that iteration that the first item, in this case the six, is the max. And then as we go through the list, we're going to say for each of those items, we're going to ask the question, is six greater or smaller than the current item that we're looking at? the ith item if you will if six is less than the ith item then that ith item becomes the new max so in our case you know the six starts out as the max checks with the three still six is the largest checks with the one six is larger checks with seven seven's larger now seven is the new max we check seven against four two and five and we see that seven is the item that is uh, the max in this case right once we've selected that largest item, the selection sort algorithm then takes the step to swap that with the last item in the list. And so in this case, the last item is the 5. We're going to swap the 7 and the 5, putting the 7 at the end, uh, and putting the 5 where the 7 once was. Okay, so the way that this is accomplished is, you know, I, I said we're comparing... Um, across the list finding that maximum item we do that typically with a for loop right so we've got this for loop of comparisons that's happening and it's starting at the beginning of the list and going all the way to the end of the list right um, once we've accomplished that we perform that swap and then we repeat the whole process over again so not only do we have this for loop where we are comparing across items in the list We've got a second for loop, which is the outer for loop, actually, that repeats that whole process vertically, if you will, right? So we just did one step where we've placed the seven in the correct place, and I've denoted that with a blue outline here. We're going to repeat this process now um, on the remaining portion of the list. The seven's good. We don't have to mess with that any further. It's as though now we're just sorting these first six items uh, and um, ending with the sixth position here, uh, not the end, right? So we've got this outer for loop now that's going to repeat the comparison loop, okay? Um, so we start it again. In this case, uh, the six is the max, right? We compare across all the way to the two. Notice importantly, we do not compare with the seven anymore because if we did, seven would be the max and that would break things because we already have seven where we want it to be. We don't want to swap this, you know, anything with the seven, the seven's good we want to just be looking at a smaller subset of this list from the six to the two. So you kind of want to keep that in mind as you're going about coding this, right? The first time the comparisons for loop ran through all seven items. The second time through the list, it's not running through all seven, it's only running through these six because we've already correctly placed one of those items. And so you have to think, how do I adjust my for loop to end at a changing position, right? Moving down the list as I uh, sort things correctly. Okay, so great. The second time through the loop, the six is the max. It gets swapped to the end. The end is now the two, not the seven. And so we have this happen, right? And the result is this, right? The two has moved to the front of the list, which isn't the right place for the two, but that doesn't matter. The selection sort is not worried about the item at the end of the list. It's only worried about swapping the max to that end position. If that end position, the current end, gets swapped to a not so good position, that's okay, right? Um, this two actually ends up being swapped pretty close to where it needs to be, but you might end up swapping a relatively high number to the beginning of the list. That doesn't really matter. The idea behind the selection sort is that after each iteration, we've 
put in the correct place the next highest value, right? So the highest value first, then the next highest value, then the next highest value, etc. Okay, we could go through this through all the steps of the selection sort, but hopefully at this point you kind of understand what's happening, right? The next time we go through, we're going to find the five as the max, swap it with the four, okay? And hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to jump to um, the full set of steps here, right? So this is the full set of steps that would happen after the selection sort is complete. Uh, you can see I've got seven steps because we had seven items. Um, we had done these first few steps together. Again, in the next step, it would have found the five and swapped that with the four, okay? In the next step, happily, the four is already in the right spot. But here's the, the unhappy part. We still have to do all of the comparisons in order to figure out that the four was the max. And then the only thing we save potentially is that swap. We don't have to swap four with itself, I guess, because it's in the right spot. But the selection sort algorithm still had to do the work of checking Hey, two, start two as the max. Uh, is three bigger than two? Yes, three is the max. Is one bigger than three? No, three is still the max. Is four bigger than three? Yes, four is the new max. We swap it with itself, right? So all of those comparisons still had to happen uh, in order to make this non-step, if you will, occur. And so that's sort of a downfall or a sort of a disadvantage of the selection sort. Um, just because something's in the right spot already doesn't mean it saved us any work, really. Um, Okay, from there, we swap the three and the one, and then finally we swap the one and the two, and the whole thing is sorted, right? I want you to kind of pay attention to this picture a little bit. We're going to come back to it. Uh, notice some features about it. I'm not going to say anything about it myself, but there should be some things that kind of stand out to you as you look at this picture, uh, and they're going to help us understand the big O behavior a little bit. And so we're going to jump into that now, the big O behavior. So, uh, in order to understand the big O behavior of this sort or any particular sorting algorithm, we want to think about comparisons and the comparisons at each step. Now, when I say step, I mean the step of putting an item in the right position, okay? So, we had seven steps, if you will, because there were seven items in our list. Um, what I've listed here at the end of each of those steps is the number of comparisons at that step, right? And I'll try to be careful about this so you understand what I'm saying there were six comparisons in this first step. Why am I saying six? Well, I said earlier that at the beginning, we want to basically assume that the first item is the max. It may not be, it likely won't be, but we need to start somewhere. So we're going to assume that this is the max, and then we're going to compare this in succession to each of the remaining items. There are only six remaining items, and so there are only six comparisons that happen in this step, even though we're dealing with seven numbers. So there were six comparisons here, as we move down a step, we've got the item number seven in the right spot, and so we assume again that six is the biggest number, and we only have one, two, three, four, five numbers to compare to, and so that's where that five is coming from. Likewise, as we move down the steps, eventually we get to the last step where we swapped the two and the one, and we don't have to do any comparisons in the last step because um, once all but one of the numbers are in the right place, so is the last number. So uh, you can kind of see what's going on there, and I've listed the total of the comparisons here off to the right, 21, okay? Again, we're going to kind of come back to this picture and uh, draw some conclusions about that, but this 21 number, that might um, that might have some extra meaning for some of you uh, based on what we've done here. Uh, let's take a look. Where does this 21 come from, and can we generalize it for an n other than 7, right? When I say n, I mean the number, the size of the list, right? So in our case, n is 7. For a size n of 7, we had 21 comparisons. Okay. How does that help us with big O? Well, again, for a size of n of 7, we had 21 comparisons, which was the sum of those numbers uh, 1 through 6. <clears throat> that 6 happened to be n minus 1, right? If n is 7, n minus 1 is 6. So you might remember from math, depending on the math course that you've had so far, that if you sum the integers from 1 to n, uh, you can calculate that sum with the expression n times the quantity n plus 1 over 2. Uh, I won't prove that here, but yeah, you can look that up if, you, if you're curious. Our sequence doesn't go all the way up to n, right? It doesn't go up to 1, 1 to n. It goes 1 to n minus 1. So I'm going to replace each n with n minus 1 in this expression. So this n becomes n minus 1, and n plus 1 minus 1 becomes n, 
right? And so I have n minus 1 times n all over 2, or in our case, uh, since n is 7, we get 6 times 7, which is 42. 42 divided by 2, of course, is 21, and so I verified that that expression seemed to work in our case. Okay, um, why is that important? Well, that's important because of the relationship that this expression has to the size of the list n. And so we're going to delve into that a little bit, and that's going to kind of give us shed some light on the big O behavior, right? This is the important part. If we look at this expression a little bit more carefully, we see that we can kind of rearrange it a little bit as one half times the quantity n squared minus n, okay? This expression is a constant multiple, one half, of this expression n squared minus n. But n squared minus n is an expression in n of degree two, right? And so we've got a constant multiple of an expression in n of degree two, okay? And that tells us that the selection sort operates or um, evaluates or uh, you know works on the order of n squared okay so when we say on the order of what we mean is it's some con the time it takes the number of steps it takes however you want to kind of phrase that the complexity um, of this algorithm is some constant multiple in our case one half of n squared okay the size of the list now is it you know, is it one half of n squared? No, right? There's a little bit more going on here. There's this minus n. That minus n is insignificant when it's compared to the n squared, right? So we're looking at sort of the uh, largest degree, the dominant degree, the degree of the polynomial, if you will, um, that this expression um, is based in, right? And so because this expression is dominated by n squared, and we've got a constant multiple of that, we say that this selection sort algorithm uh, is big O of n squared, right? So we say that is big O of n squared. Um, and that's how we calculate big O. We don't need to calculate the wrong word. That's how we determine or, or um, evaluate an algorithm for its big O behavior. And so we can sort of see that in the algebraic expression here. I want to kind of jump back to the picture and see how we can see it there as well. Uh, so keep in mind, let me just jump here one more time. Um, we'll go to this one. We got n minus 1 times n over 2 was our expression that gave us the 21. We can actually see that visually if we look at the steps, right? If we consider the fact that this first column um, represents a non-comparison because we're just going to assume that this first column is the max in each step, right? So discount this first column. The number of comparisons is represented by the remaining columns, right? So six six remaining columns, five remaining columns, four remaining columns, okay? So if we look at sort of just, if you will, I'll try to highlight it, this big rectangle, and you can see that rectangle is six items wide, right? And seven items tall, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Well, guess what? Six times seven is 42. But the number of comparisons that we are dealing with in this rectangle is, is represented by the green items, not the blue ones. The blue ones are already in the right place. We don't compare to the blue ones. And so you can see we've only got half of that, that rectangle in green representing the comparisons. So half of this rectangle represents the comparisons we have to do for this algorithm, which of course is half of n minus 1 times n. And so, you know, visually we can see, okay, that's not a square, but if we were to add an eight element to this list for per se, um, you could see that we would be adding a column, but we'd also be adding a row at the bottom for that extra step. So by adding one item to this list, we would be increasing the size of this rectangle in two dimensions, right? Both its width and its height. And so that's why it's dependent upon n squared and not just n itself, for instance, right? Um, so hopefully that helps you kind of see, you know, visually why this is a, a big O of n squared algorithm. Um, that's kind of what I was going for here. And hopefully that makes sense and that kind of connects it to that algebraic expression that we've got here. Um, and that, that all kind of ties that together. Now, as you move to implement this in code, you want to think again about what, you know, what are the ways in which we are 
producing these steps, right? And again, I'll just sort of ha rehash that a little bit. We want two for loops, right? We want a, a for loop that goes through the comparisons in a row. And that's actually our inner for loop because we want to do that over and over again for as number of as many rows as we have, in this case seven, but generally however the size of your list is. Um, and so then we have that outer for loop that accomplishes that repetition, okay? And again, just to highlight, in the selection sort, you want to realize that, that the comparison for loop, the inner for loop, is getting smaller, runs one fewer time each step down through the algorithm because each time we've got one more item already in the correct place and so we don't have to go to the end of the list in effect the end of the list is moving you know down closer to the beginning of the list one position every step down through the algorithm okay um, hopefully that helps and so uh, yeah next step will be to implement that selection sort in code and uh, I wish you the best of luck and ask me if you have any questions